Hey folks, and welcome to another edition of Helium Hacks Happy Hour. Uh, my name is Travis. I go by TT on Discord, and I will be your host this evening. So um, thank you, everyone who's joining us, and I hope everyone had a good week and is having a good week so far. So, um, so what's going on? Um, if you're new to the call, I do ask that you unmute and introduce yourself to the group. Uh, this is a very casual call, and uh, really open to discuss anything, um, you know, helium related, helium adjacent uh, many times uh, that you'd like to discuss. And um, it, we may have a couple people that are going to be dropping in and giving short talks that should be rather interesting tonight. I know one of them uh, we, we've discussed on this um, program in the past, so it uh, should be exciting. But uh, do we have any new folks here today? Yep, I'm new. What's up? Hey, uh, nice to nice to meet you. I um, yeah, my name's Matthew. I'm uh, the guy who goes on and on about ballooning stuff in um, ah. in the helium channel. I've been meaning to stop by for a little while just to say hi to everyone, and um, if if you're interested, show you some of the stuff I've been working on, which uh, leverages helium. Uh, absolutely, and uh, I, I'm so happy you were able to swing by and uh, jump in, in on the call tonight. Uh, we've discussed this, you know, time and time again on this call, so it's it's great to to hear about the project uh, directly from you. So yeah, um, I've got some pictures to show too, so should be should be fun. Excellent, excellent. I'm looking forward to it. There we go. Uh, is that working? Yeah. Yep. We see your desktop. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so my name is Matthew. I'm a PhD student in um, space physics in Calgary, Canada. And um, I found helium because we are using LoRa for some of our near space experiments. Pretty much the deal is uh, we fly balloons into the upper atmosphere. Um, these are fairly large polyethylene structures, which are uh, filled with helium. Here's a, here's a fairly small example actually over here. Um, the fellow on the uh, the fellow on the left is me, and then here's another technician. We are filling it through this hose over here. They carry payloads that can be up to a couple hundred kilograms or more, and they fly to altitudes of 35 to 40 kilometers, give or take, for periods of a few days before they uh, before they land. The reason we're doing all this is because we are interested in measurements of the northern lights. So when uh, when the sun is really active and particles come down from space into the atmosphere, they do a whole bunch of really complicated things that we would love to try to understand, but they're very difficult to measure because the Earth's atmosphere is an excellent shield of radiation. So if you send radiation down from space, 100% of it gets blocked by the air before it reaches the ground. If you put your detector on one of these balloons, they actually fly so close to space that they get above most of the atmosphere by mass. And then we can make our measurements. My particular field is in um, energetic electron precipitation. So uh, electrons that come down from the radiation belts and uh, learning more about the energetics of the near Earth space environment by making those measurements. So we've been doing this for uh, a fair number of years now, and I started about four years ago. And um, what we were using for data transmission from the, uh, from the science instrument and from the GPS to track it and our housekeeping systems, we basically been using Iridium uh, short data burst uh, modems. Uh, you can buy these things from Rock Seven. They're, um, for example, they're not they're not expensive for what they are. They're about two hundred and fifty American dollars each, and uh, data credits depending on what sort of plan you have. I mean, ballpark figure, it can cost you about twenty five American cents to send a hundred bytes or so, and uh, you can only do that once every in practical terms once a few times a minute, but it depends on where the satellites are. So one of my interests has been in coming up with a way to transfer our data back better and to do it in such a way that we don't need to use the expensive Iridium modems. Um, so I found uh, over the last few years, LoRa is a great modulation to use for a large number of reasons. 
It's uh, super resistant to noise. It's got an immense link budget. Uh, you can tune the parameters to uh, work in to work in a baud rate that that is compatible with your project. And the parts are incredibly cheap. Um, it's common now that I send test balloons and actually don't get them back because the cost of fuel to go and retrieve them exceeds the cost of the parts that was used to build them. Um, if you want to see, this is a picture of uh, what the view looks like from up there. It's fairly pretty. Um, this was a NASA balloon flight that I worked with on a student team. We weren't using helium for this yet, but this is uh, this is the environment that you find yourself in. So above 99.8% of the atmosphere by mass, give or take. So uh, where does helium come into this? One of the main problems I've had with line of sight point to point lower links is that almost inevitably the vehicle which is chasing one of these balloons loses line of sight because it goes behind a hill or it goes behind a tree or a building and uh, we lose packets that way. And so it's a very difficult planning problem to try to get out ahead of your target of this balloon, which is usually moving like 200 kilometers an hour in the upper level stratospheric winds. And uh, to also plan it so that you always have a line of sight to the, uh, to the target. So a distributed decentralized network of stations that automatically forward packets to the internet is absolutely ideal for this kind of project, in my opinion. One other thing which is really important about Helium is that it supports uplinks uh, to the balloon, that is. So in the Helium language, that would be a downlink from the system. So there are uplinks and downlinks, and that allows us to actually control things on the flight, which is not at all an easy thing to do using other technologies. So this is a picture of what happens when your line of sight link is not that great and uh, you have to connect to the thing and you get this big gaggy antenna and try to point it in the right direction and it still didn't work and um, I mean there's a whole lot of things that can happen to cause this process to go wrong. One of them is that it's easily minus 50 on the way up through the uh, through the tropopause beginning of the stratosphere. And then once you hit the stratosphere, it goes to like plus 50. So depending on your components, there could easily be a 70 degree Celsius difference between the transmitter oscillator and the receiver, which can cause huge problems. Um, if you handle all of this, you've still got the issue that if you get out of line of sight, then you've got no signal. And that's just a fundamental reality of RF in the in the higher frequencies. HF communication like the ham radio guys use is not suitable for this, partly because the bandwidth is so low, but also because it's really sporadic. You can't, it's not predictable what where the signal winds up really. So um, one of my main interests and one of the reasons helium is really cool is while you launch balloons like this, this is a near space corporation balloon. It costs around 20,000 American dollars and another 10,000 give or take on top of that to fill it with helium. And it works exactly once. After the thing has completed its mission, there's actually an explosive bolt that fires. It will uh, cut the, um, sorry, I've got something in the way here. There's an explosive bolt that fires and it actually rips a panel out of the balloon and then deploys a parachute and the thing comes crashing down and then this whole structure goes in the garbage. Our new generation detectors for our science work are actually pretty light, only about the size of a shoebox and only weighing about a kilogram, which makes them an excellent target to use smaller balloons like, I believe it's this picture. No, here's one of the bigger ones in flight just after launch. There's the payload box down there, a parachute and a radar reflector. Uh, one of the smaller ones, I'm not sure I have that picture, is a typical weather balloon. Um, not much bigger than a couple couple feet in diameter. So uh, the problem with the small weather balloons is that you set them off, you fill them up, and then you tie the ends. They're just big latex balloons. They go up at a roughly constant ascent rate, and then they pop, and they uh, crash down to the ground, which is not compatible with what we need, which is to stay up in the upper atmosphere like 30, 40 kilometers for tens of hours at a time and collect data. 
So what I've done is I've come up with a device, which uh, you can see here, it runs on the helium network and it's pretty simple. All that it is, is it's a pipe, one inch SCAD 40 PVC pipe, a 3D printed end part, two CR2 batteries, a servo and uh, an RF module. And what it does is as a function of altitude, it will actually open and vent out helium or hydrogen from the balloon and then close to seal it adaptively to execute a certain ascent profile. And you can control how high it goes as a function of time using that. Uh, for the actual connection to helium, I'm just using one of these. It's just a Haltech Laura V2 in the ESP32. These things are everywhere. They're really cheap, only about 20 bucks on AliExpress. And now we can fly balloons that are the functional equivalent of that $20,000 polyethylene balloon with a two or $300 latex balloon, some 3D printed parts, and of course the helium network. So we pipe back our data in um, you know, bytes, a uh, couple hundred bytes per packet. And uh, I actually just forward it to my own server to, um, to process it in real time. And uh, we've actually had quite a bit of success with this uh, in terms of our sort of command and control capabilities. We can achieve about a one second delay between what we want to have happen on the balloon and what happens. So usually for these, we have sort of a mission controller, and then we actually have a pilot who's in charge of monitoring where this thing goes as a function of time and making corrections, dropping ballast and uh, venting gas as necessary. And when the mission is over, we can uh, target the landing by opening this and uh, controlling the descent rate. And since we have models of the upper atmospheric winds, we can land the thing and go and retrieve it. The uh, last flight that I did, I'll just um, open up a URL here. Uh, why some of you have probably seen this. This is just a prototype dashboard for the uh, last balloon flight we used. The last packet I got was at an altitude of 16 kilometers. It was a uh, very small pilot balloon, test balloon. Wasn't moving that fast, but the GPS had a great lock. And critically, uh, I was sending packets both up and down roughly once every second, and our RSSIs and our SNRs were great. But what was really cool was this balloon was near Calgary, Alberta. And if I can just move this bar over here, just a second. The uh, receiving station was Stale Mossy Baboon, which if I look up, um, I believe this one was actually in Montana, if I remember right. No, this one was back in Calgary, but there was a packet before this one, which was received all the way down around here in, uh, in Butte, Montana. So that was received over a distance of at least three or 400 kilometers from where the balloon was, which was around here at the time when we lost contact. So that is what I'm using helium for, for um, some, of our, uh, some of our research. And uh, I'm really excited about it because it, uh, it reduces the cost of the hardware. It makes near real time links in both directions, at least for small packets of data achievable. And critically, since there are so many antennas over so many different terrains, um, even here in Calgary, I mean, there's at least, at least 20 of them. The odds of your balloon, which already has a good line of sight being completely out of line of sight for every single one of these stations are about zero. So we, uh, we completely bypass that problem. And that is, uh, that's pretty much what we're, what we're working on and what we're achieving using, using this technology. Can we see the picture of your, uh, of your device again? I, I don't think we got to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, let me, uh, if I stop screen sharing, thank you. Then we get this device over here. So uh, I, I guess I held this up before, but it occurs to me I was screen sharing. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so it's just a piece of SCED 40 PVC pipe into a, uh, I don't know what you might term this, but it's a body made of PLA and uh, a flat valve on the end, which opens and closes according to a servo. Two CR2 batteries, six volts in series for the servo, three volts, just one of them for the microcontroller. And I just throw an ESP-01 on this, 
uh, have it connect over Wi-Fi with our main science board, which I don't have with me here, but which has one of these modules on these uh, ESP modules. And uh, then from there, interfaces with the LoRaWAN network. That is super cool. Thanks. I, uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to see this work. Yeah, um, that's really cool. Um, I have one question. What did you say? How far was the balloon from the nearest hotspot? I think you said it, but I missed it. Um, I only have an estimate for that one, but it's at least 300 kilometers, probably closer to four. Damn. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, actually really cool because from what I understand, a lot of hotspots um, at this stage don't see traffic, uh, at least not immediately, but the balloon paints them all with traffic uh, as they go. And I think it's just a race condition as to which one that I get first. That's crazy. And I can't believe it was 300 kilometers. You know, the world record for uh, the Things Network, someone else did this um, higher than my test. I think it was 700 kilometers, but that probably involves some tropospheric ducting. Wow. Be interesting to know the DV of that antenna on that device that was picking up your balloon. Yeah, it would be. Um, I have a feeling that since I was on spreading factor mm -hmm. nine and the link budget goes down pretty far, you know, minus 130-ish, I think, DB. <laughs> he was probably just using an Omni antenna and was in a really good location. Because all my antennas are, are um, I don't use these stub antennas because I don't have a good ground plane on these devices, but I just use a dipole. So my antenna had, um, had unity gain, roughly. And uh, his was probably, I, I would imagine, not much different than the, uh, the rack wireless. But that's speculation, I'm, uh, I'm not that's sure. That's very encouraging. Yeah, it's the reason that I really like this modulation is because it makes things like that possible. It's if you have a line of sight and if your settings are at least reasonable, you will make contact because you've just got that much link budget. Before um, using this antenna, I mean, using a, uh, using a directional antenna, let me just share this again. It was, uh, if, you're, if you're doing something like frequency shift keying with little or no forward error correction, it's um, in a completely different regime. I mean, you need, you need a strong signal that is some decibels above the noise floor in my experience to work, uh, which is hard, right? I mean, you're on these, these platforms, you have limited power, you have uh, limited ability to dissipate heat and um, you have an operating time which has to extend sometimes into the tens of hours or even days. And uh, it can be critical to be able to maintain contact with these things, uh, especially for um, you know, aviation safety. They, uh, they want to know where these are. Well, I really uh, appreciate you sharing this. This has been incredible uh, what you're able to do and how you're doing it and how much easier it's you know, it, it, thank you. I, um, I was super happy when I found that uh, the cost for running these experiments in terms of data went from thousands of dollars to less than $1 per experiment. That's fantastic. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, Iridium short burst data, right? If you're sending kilobytes of data over their satellite network, which is the only other option, really, a lot of the time, it is incredibly expensive and um, adds up quick. And the other thing I found is depending on where the Iridium satellite constellation is, it's configured. I mean, it has, it's not a perfect coverage. Uh, you can sometimes wait five or so minutes before the satellites come back and you can get a packet through in either direction. And five minutes is actually a long time to wait when you're wondering, you know, is my balloon still alive? Is my payload working? Has it burst? Is it coming careening down towards the ground? You know, what's, what's going on here? But I have one more thing to show you guys, if it's okay. Absolutely, absolutely. That. That, was, I, that was awesome. You know what else I've been thinking is you can probably use this really effectively. The other problem they have is tracking, uh, getting hurricane data and tornado data, mm. getting that back. If we have enough of these devices out there, we're receiving all kinds of data and we'll make all kinds of uh, uh, advances with weather. You know, uh, with, with Earth weather as well as space weather, it turns out, um, they're, they're good platforms for both. One question so, I, I want to interject. Yeah, um, have you looked at the, um, the multi-packet purchase 
um, on, on labels that you can do through Helium now? You had mentioned uh, just being able to get one um, payload from a hotspot coming through. Yeah, and for my uh, for my own tests, I've left it at that, but I could certainly up that to, uh, the data costs are so low, it yeah. may well make sense to up that to five or 10 even just to uh, see which hotspots are getting it. I wouldn't set it to all. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, because you, you get half the continent in. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, got, why do I have no data credits all of a sudden? Well, that's the reason. Um, but yeah, actually getting two or three of those different stations might be uh, might be a good decision, I think. And Matthew, when you initially showed this to me, um, and I, I, I was just really excited, and was talking with uh, Nick over at Helium Vision, who has been doing, uh, yeah, I mean, some amazing, some amazing work with mapping. And um, I, I think, uh, Nick, are you on the call here, man? Yeah, I am. Hey, guys. Hey. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if you caught the entire presentation here, but um, I, I wanted to kind of bring you in. Matthew, I hope you don't mind. No, not at all, please. But um, it, it, Nick, I'm going to hand the mic to you here. And uh, can you show, do you still have some screen caps or something from the other night? Yeah, yeah. So uh, so uh, this was a while back. And, and when I share my screen, you guys will see like kind of a outdated version of Helium Vision. But um, Travis uh, let me know, hey, there's this balloon in the sky. It's super cool. Check this out. And, and I was able to go take a peek at your, uh, your dashboard. So I... I uh, kind of at the same time began prototyping 3D witness lines within Helium Vision. And so I just took um, the, the coordinates of your balloon and I put a sphere in the air. Uh, you know, I have no clue how uh, close to the real size of your balloon pretty, it is. Pretty that close, they are spherical. They're, they're uh, very spherical. But yeah, if you guys want, I can share my screen and show you what I came up with. It's not perfect. Uh, sure, let me stop mine here. I was just trying to hack at it, but it was fun. Um, and it I, I remember seeing this while we were launching that. I was, uh, it was unfortunate that that wasn't one of my better flights. I wish I had more data to send you, but yeah, uh, <coughs> yeah that looks great. So and this, you can really get a perspective for just how high these things go. Yeah, so that, that was, uh, you know, the approximate location. I, you know, it was static. It's just hard coding, mm -hmm. flat, flat, long elevation, but um, the, the model has a uh, bounding box, which is the reason that the witness line, it's on the corner of the bounding box as opposed to the center of the sphere. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to get the map right and I just ended up moving on. But yeah, it was, it was uh, pretty cool. So I took the, the coordinates of the balloon and had the witness line at one end. And then I took the, the coordinates of the hotspot that was the one that was witnessing it at the time which happened to be down in Calgary, and um, the other end of the line takes you to uh, downtown. That one, right downtown. Now, I think that the tall buildings down there, which are unfortunately mostly empty right now for a number of reasons, are uh, being well utilized as <laughs> quite helium hotspots by the community here. Yeah. Um, that one downtown on 6th Avenue has received almost all of my packets across almost every flight. It's it's sort of the main one. And I think he's also, or he or she also has a fast internet connection in that building, which ah. might factor into it. The, the Knowing that the uh, elevation data was coming to the blockchain, this was kind of a precursor to 3D witness lines, which um, mm. I certainly plan to integrate once once there's more uh, elevation data in the blockchain. Right now, it's, it's still, um, you know, sparse. Right, only the newly asserted hotspots generally have it. So, anyways, um, yeah, I thought it was super cool. So I, I like what you're doing, and um, I would certainly be excited to collaborate with you. You know, if I know you're going to do it. Um, yeah, um, it, it, if it's if it's all right, can I reach out to you guys um, just over the Discord? I I try to do these things um, with a, I mean, weather dependent, right? That's why it sort of seems like it's always last minute. But it probably give you a day or two heads up as to what we're planning on trying at least. And um, only around 50% of the time does it get scrubbed due to weather. That's, so, that's um, all right. Um, are you able to consistently, uh, and I'm super naive around how this operates. So are you able to consistently use the same device within, within uh, the Helium console or is every launch a new device? Uh, well, lately I've been using the same plan for the device and the same physical device, but I just replace it every time. 
the okay. uh, for these little ones, these ones actually that I've launched recently don't have science payloads on them. If they did, we'd be getting them back. But to uh, prove the concept of the altitude control valve and the communication over the helium network, you don't need it. So I usually fly a dummy payload with some sand in it. And okay. uh, at that point, if this goes, you know, if it works and it goes a few hundred kilometers away, it's better just to order more Helltech B2s off of it, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I well, put a sign on it saying, this is harmless, please ship it back to me if you find it, but I haven't heard one. So yeah. I think I think you pretty much say goodbye to these after you after you set them off. At least you have a, you have, this is not a UFO or a bomb? Like yeah, stickers, I mean, right now I've, I've used the words harmless amateur radio experiment. Okay. Um, <laughs> Didn't, didn't get into more detail than that yeah if you want to reach out we can connect and um basically you can get um we could do a helium vision integration right where from from the helium console you can send over uplinks and then yeah, that would I be really useful because um you know i've been hacking around in node red to do all of the other stuff and uh if there was something pre-made then i'm all for it i mean it saves why well, duplicate effort right that's uh right. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know that I would say that it's pre-made, but it's this is certainly an interesting enough use case to get my attention. So, um, well, yeah. if it's okay, we'll uh, we'll be in touch over the Discord. I'm a fairly fairly frequently on there, and I'll uh, I'll give you guys the heads up a few days a few days before we give it a shot. I had one other thing to show, if that's okay. Yeah, sounds great. <clears throat> um, so this is admittedly more of a side project of mine. I. Uh, get in a little bit of trouble for spending too much time on it when I should be doing PhD research, but uh, I couldn't let it go. There was a way back in the day before, before say SpaceX, before the space shuttle, before even good sounding rockets, like think back when we were experimenting with V2 rockets captured from Germany in World War II. It was impossible to send rocket payloads to high altitudes just using a big rocket, which is what they do nowadays. It's more economical. What they would do is they would bring a small rocket up on a balloon. They would cut it loose from the balloon, and then they'd light it off, and uh, they would easily reach space using... I'll show you a picture here, just a second. Um, the concept is called a raccoon, or a rocket balloon. And there's a picture of Van Allen uh, if I just find it here, with uh, a raccoon that was used for actual space research. Here, let me share this picture. So that was the size of the rocket that reached space back then by virtue of dragging it up on a high altitude balloon, which skips most of the atmosphere by mass. And so there's almost no drag on it, which means the motor, which only extends about halfway up this thing, was enough to put this not on an orbital trajectory, of course, but enough to do a suborbital flight 150 kilometers, give or take. So a friend of mine and I sat down at lunch one day and thought, um, okay, well, that was really cool. And it fell, it falls out of favor for a large number of logistical reasons. And nowadays it's just cheaper to pay SpaceX to launch a huge Falcon 9, which shares many payloads, sharing the cost amongst all of them. And uh, I mean, there's a bajillion reasons why this isn't done anymore. But we just asked the academic question, what happens if you try this with modern technology? I mean, this was in the 50s. There would be vacuum tubes up there. Radio transmitter is probably a huge device. This whole thing probably weighs 50 kilograms easily. And uh, what, we, what we came up with was uh, actually closer to something that looks something that looks like this. This is a prototype sort of that we simulated for a balloon launched rocket using a LoRa transmitter and a normal weather balloon. And this is, it's a two-stage design. This is the altitude profile that you can expect using commercial off-the-shelf rocket motors. Your first stage, and mind you, this is above the launch point. So your first stage gets you easily to 50 kilometers, up from 30. Your second stage takes you well past the Kármán line. And uh, so we built one of these things. And I really want to show you the picture. So let me just find it real quick. We've what does FAA say what that even looks like? Um, well, you know, I actually, I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. It turns out in Canada, they're actually way more lax about these things, which is, which is sort of cool. Uh, here it is. They changed, um, or the federal government here in the States changed a munition 
um, laws on drones and on um, unmanned uh, aircraft last what last year the year before last yeah that's right it was a big big shake yeah yeah um sorry where did that go okay here is here's what it looks like it's that big <laughs> totally so legit it, yeah it's uh but most <laughs> of this is fuel right this is the biggest composite model rocket motor that i could find that i could get without any sort of special clearance or anything it's a commercial off-the-shelf rocket kit and the launcher is just this so it's two rings or squares i guess of pla four strips of normal insulation styrofoam. The rocket slides in through the top like that, and the balloon ties on on the top. And uh, inside the rocket, inside the nose cone there, is a helium LoRa transceiver and a GPS which works at high altitude. So um, we are getting ready to launch this thing, and it would be really cool if it would work, but um, you know, it's uh, it's it's a high risk, high payoff endeavor. If it works, it means that for a couple hundred bucks, you can launch something, albeit really lightweight, past the Carmen line, and uh, you can do it using completely commercial off the shelf parts. Can That's you explain so real real quick what you mean by high altitude GPS? Yeah. So um, most, if not like, I'd say most GPSs have uh, limits called COCOM limits which will shut off the GPS if it goes past a certain speed or past a certain height. In practice, a lot of manufacturers have that as an or statement, not an and statement, which means that even if you're really slow, like on a balloon, you can't go past 10 kilometers high or else your GPS shuts off. And I've struggled a lot with this. Yeah. Some manufacturers implement the limits correctly and it is an and statement, which means you can go as high as you want or as fast as you want, but not both at the same time, because then you're building a missile. Yeah, right. So um, for this, fortunately, at Apogee, because it's not an orbital thing, it goes up on a parabola, and then at the top, it should be almost at a standstill. So we're hoping to get a GPS lock to show how high it went. Cool. Very cool. So that's the uh, that's the more, um, yeah, that's what I've been doing in my spare time, is uh, working on working on getting one of those launched. And I finally have a huge distributed array of ground stations to track these things which seems to be growing really fast and that is uh that is more helpful than you can imagine because it took a project which was basically impossible and turned it into something you can do with uh stuff you can get from amazon with next day shipping pretty much this is this is fantastic we we have a number of questions if you have a few moments oh, to, yeah absolutely uh, sorry i don't mean to hog your whole uh your, no, no 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 this is no you you are the show so uh -oh. <laughs> um well, that's scary but there are there are some questions here that i want to make sure that are addressed mm -hmm. and so if anyone asked a question in here uh just if you could just unmute and and ask your question and we'll do that format here I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> so, I was, so I mean, I've so I've launched a balloon before. I did it with the local TV station, and we ended up using APRS, and it worked fine. But we had a horrible we had a horrible problem with um, recovery, and we actually ended up using the TV station's uh, uh, like traffic helicopter to go find it, wow. uh, which was which was a nice perk of doing it with the TV station. Um, so I'm worried about using, you know, using helium for recovery, and obviously you're not doing it, so that probably asks the question. But I'm wondering what the feasibility would be of sticking a hub in a chase car. Now, obviously, you couldn't mine because you're moving, so you cannot define your location. But if the payload contained GPS coordinates, I guess there's no reason you couldn't stick a helium hotspot in a chase car, right, in theory? Yeah, and uh, in fact, we've done that. I used a, uh, I was using the Things Network back um, when I first tried this. And uh, I would be using, uh, when I switched over to Helium, because the huge number of stations that exist now, especially where I live, um, I uh, fully plan on doing that as soon as I can get my hands on a, uh, either the parts to build a DIY miner or an actual miner. I, uh, and uh, Anyway, when we did this with the Things Network and their gateway, it worked perfectly for recovering it. Uh, the big asterisk is if you have a line of sight, and that's very hard when the thing lands on the ground, 
So if I really want it back, what I usually do is I also um, put a, a spot hiking tracker on it, which uh, doesn't work at high altitudes, but will work after it lands. And so you get this hybrid thing where you get all the goodness of LoRa and uh, RF in near real time when it's flying. And then this backup, it's like, okay, you get one point after the thing lands on the ground, but there's exactly where it is. Yeah, you blew my mind though with the, with the bi-directional thing. That is the bi-directional, the bi-directional data and being able to unload ballast has kind well, of blown I mean, my mind, especially if you could, if you could also vent some of the, if you could also vent some of the helium as well. That's you what this is for. Potentially, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you could potentially keep a balloon at a specific altitude because you can that control is, that. So it's not, so it's not like, you know, you would have a balloon that go up to a certain height where they normally pop and then they immediately fall to earth. You could maintain an altitude and, and have a flight that lasts for an extended period of time. And that just kind of blew my mind a little. That's exactly what we need and exactly what we're working on. Now, for science, you need that to be, uh, oh, not longer than 12 hours or so. We usually do these over the course of a night of observations. Um, you can do them over the day, too. But uh, from an amateur radio perspective, I would like to put a repeater on one of these things, control it over helium, and uh, see if we could do something really cool like circumnavigate the Earth or, or something like that. Yeah, that's amazing. I'll tell you what, you have definitely expanded and blown my mind this evening, so thank you. I really appreciate it. Oh, i got so many ideas bouncing around now, it's, it's blowing my mind. If you ever want to talk about these sorts of things, I mean, I'm, I, I don't... I am far from an expert on the topic of ballooning, but um, I always do it, and I'm almost always in the Discord. Unfortunately, since I've done it, I've now got the addiction, so it's happening. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly addicting. It's thrilling. It's so much fun. Now, what I would love to do this summer is if a really big storm comes up, like a big thunderstorm, I would like to team up with the local storm chasers and send one of these into, uh, into you know, sort of the eye of a big thunderstorm and see how that goes. I mean, literally, our payload, was nothing as, our payload was nothing as exciting as scientific. It was cameras, but I think the, my favorite shot from the cameras was we got a we got video of a plane flying underneath our balloon that at the same so distance cool. that the plane was from the ground. Insane! That's uh, wow. That that's really cool. How it was just pointed at the right place and uh, was it there at the right time to catch capture that? It's really neat. We'll point straight down. So yeah, it was glorious. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. Can you look at the GNSS stuff as opposed to GPS? Uh, you know what? I haven't actually. I um, I know that there are ways you can go with that that would work. Um, the attractive part about GPS for me is that once you get a module that is specced to work in this regime, um, they're only like five dollars each. So it, it, it syncs really well with my, uh, you know, don't have to get this thing back philosophy I'm working with right now. But yeah, that would certainly be an option. I know the racks are, they just released a new uh, like $22 GPS that's GNSS and several other things involved. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I have a feeling that as more of this kind of technology comes out and becomes cheaper and more accessible, the solutions to this will be less and less custom and more and more off the shelf and easy. And it's pretty much there already. Um, along those lines, I would like to, uh, I, I think you, I try to give a helium dev kit away on these calls. You won it tonight. I, I, I don't think you're going to get an argument from anyone on this call. So, um, well, um, if you would like to put a helium dev kit on a balloon, I can make that happen. Actually, well, the thing is, on these dev kits, uh, you don't have to go get them back. They, you got two boards, so uh, you got you got two runs on these things. You so, want to try uh, it out? I've I've got a whole box of sort of surplus balloons and okay. a couple of cylinders of uh, of lift gas. If you would just like to try it and um, see if we could send, you know, something made from the dev kit up, I would be game to do that. Absolutely. That that sounds that sounds like a plan to me. So oh, cool. Um, uh, just just hit me up. Uh, you know, uh, shoot me your address, and I'll, I'll mail one out to you. But uh, all right, sounds great, and uh, I'll uh, I'll get it launched, but uh, no guarantees I'll get it back. Oh yeah, I'm not expecting Probably anything back, actually, man. But, um, <laughs> you know what I really want to do is uh, send one of these on a long distance flight that lasts several hours. I think we're almost there, and wow. uh, that would be a cool. 
it'd be cool to use sort of a manufactured building block set uh, rather than something more, you know, more custom to, to achieve that. Just makes it easier to build. Very cool. Hey, Travis. Yeah. There is a new GPS module coming out from RAG. Yeah, it was part of their spring. Yeah, the spring announcement. It's I squared C um, uh, based, and so you can get very quick locks on it for okay. very low power consumption. Um, Do you know yeah. what the uh, GPS is that you've got in the dev kit? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, it's a seven Q. Uh, Max seven, seven Q. That's yeah. unlocked. We can use that. Uh, that'll work the, up to fifty kilometers. Okay. The new cool. one is the eight Q. The yeah. twelve five hundred is an eight Q. Yeah, if it's a genuine U-Block 7Q, then I, I know for a fact that that will work. I don't buy them for my flow, throwaway flights because they're a more, well, they're a brand name premium, you know, GPS with a real data sheet and actual guarantees of its performance. Um, I find myself using, uh, you know, the, uh, the generic options a lot for these little flights. It'd actually be fantastic to fly one using a real GPS. Awesome. Uh... Cool, uh, and I will. I'll get my hands on some of the new ones um, as well. So, um, yeah, absolutely. This th this is fantastic. And like I say, a, lo a lot of people in the community have been asking about your projects, and you know, it's kind of been floating around Discord. And I mean, I'm so happy that you were able to join us this well, evening thank you for and give us like a proper um, explanation of everything. And it, I I definitely want. Um, you know, once you once you have a launch go on, and and man, Nick, thank you for joining as well. Uh, I, I think bringing uh, you two guys together was was very cool, and I can't wait to see you know these next launches when you can get real time tracking, you know, yeah. going on three D in the air. That's 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 neat. Well, um, we'll uh, we'll get in touch over Discord, and um, we'll set this up, and I'll try to try to give you more than a few days' notice this time. That's, uh, yeah, I uh, I sent you a, a friend request so we can connect and, and kind of uh, coordinate some logistics ahead of time. Awesome. Sounds good. Cool. Sure.